Okay. Let me give you the intro to the replay analysis that we are about to do. I really enjoy your stream. I'm a longtime fan from back in the days. So keep it up and I'll see you in Twitch. Well, it is a replay analysis submission by Pyroflow from five, six days ago. Let's see what we can make of it. He is the Falstad player. Loading this replay will disconnect you until you finish watching the replay. Okay, I accept. So let's see what we can make of this. Let's see what we can all learn from this. I'm going to show this one to Pyroflow, the original submitter of the replay, but we always endeavor to learn from the replay as a group, not just that person, but as a group. It's going to be a Towers of Doom game, which it looks like it's Team League, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know why it always sounds so loud when you reconnect. I'll fix that. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. The replay crashes sometimes if you see backwards. What do you mean if I see backwards? Like this? Death Knight? The battle begins okay, so he is the Falstad player. Let's see what we can make of it. It looks like it's team... Oh, seek backwards. Okay, I won't go backwards then. Thanks four, for the tip. Three, what ranked two, game is this? He actually did not say. He actually did not say. So we'll figure it out. Uh, oh, camera lock. Okay, so he's the Falstad player and it looks like it's team league or unranked. It was a three and a two queue. The composition here is... Well, first of all, let's just lower the volume a little bit more. I don't know why, but it sounds extra loud here. There we go. Um, okay, so we have... Let's just do a quick analysis of the draft here. We've got Poke from Chromie, Hard Engage, Diablo Kerrigan, um, Group Objective Push in Sylvanas, and a... Kind of the wrong healer for the situation. Lily is a sustain healer, but Kerrigan and Diablo need burst heals. So the opponent's draft is a little strange. Uh, Chromie can follow up with spells on Diablo, Kerrigan, hard engaging. But it's not ideal because uh, Chromie has a lot of poke, but Morales can easily out heal that. Now let's talk about what the right side team has. Double warrior which is a good thing to have when you're going up against Kerrigan. So you have more control, more protection. And they also have a mage, a bursty mage, who has a hard time against Kerrigan, but can counterattack well if there is peel and protection for her. And then they have Falstad, who can gust away if the fight is bad, which is a great thing. And overall, I would say the right side team is better, but the left side team could have a really good early game if they are able to get some pickoffs with Kerrigan. Now uh, let's talk about the draft, Mur uh, about the start. Murden was AFK, Falstaff flew mid, for which actually there is no justification because you lose your Z cooldown and you get to mid for what reason really? It's not like he's getting his gathering storm stacks to get a quick hammer, nor is there a vision point. Save your fly, walk mid, don't be lazy and keep your fly for later so you can get to the lane. I have no idea what's going on. It is a replay analysis, I am Shagar of uh, a user submitted replay and we're gonna see what we can learn from it so uh, now that Falstad used his fly even when he is revived he still can't fly top uh, xp is being missed the best solo laners in this draft well basically everyone here can solo lane except Jaina everyone else can solo lane possibly the safest to do so are Falstad, Murden and Anubara there is no reason for Anoop and Morales to be together, but they are, so whatever. The opponent is uh, rotating us four, looking to get some kills together. This is a sound strategy. And uh, Jaina needs to be careful not to get rotated on. But we're mostly going to be... T who's the user? We're mostly going to be talking on Falstad. We can't analyze everything, it's kind of pointless. So we'll mostly focus on Falstad. Now, 
They're pushing the lane together, which is uh, the benefit of that is season marksman stacks. And the disadvantage of it is that you're just putting two people in a lane without really attempt to kill anyone. Because when you both go stand in the middle of your lane, no one is going to die to that. The surprise is always better. So we see this a lot at mid to low level. Just pushing a lane together, but without any hope of getting a kill or getting siege damage. Now, let's talk about your positioning here, first of all. When you are against a Diablo, you want to stand here when you, uh, occup when you cap the point. So that you never put your back towards a wall, which would allow you to get stunned by the Shadow Charge. This should remain an obsession for you against Diablos, always to have open ground to your back. You did not know that he was coming for you, but just in case, just in case they do, you should focus on that. And this would be as fine of a place as this to, to cap. So they are actually taking yours. Shit happens. Now everyone needs to go bot to try and get one of those tower shots. You fly in. Okay. Don't use your bow roll to engage. For something that you could just fly towards him anyway. What did you really gain? You've got 20% movement speed. So you can just walk there. You still have bonus mobility compared to a chromie. There really was no rush to do so. You could just walk there and save your bow roll for escape, which is absolutely needed. Let's let's look at your cooldowns for a bit. You could either you could either have it as an escape, or you could save it to like chase him down and get a kill. How do I? I can't select you. That's a bit weird. Yeah, let's not select you then. Okay, so uh, I would say you use fly and barrel sometimes when you could just walk. Okay, let's look at your map vision at least, even if I can't click you. Oh, I did have him selected. He was dead. Ah, yes, thank you. It's zero. Okay. Okay, so you're flying in. Now, I don't know where you're flying yet. But I would suggest you should fly here if you want to catch Kerrigan. At the same time, she can use her Ravage, her Q, to escape on you. So let's see where you went. So that is way too far back in order to secure a kill. You always need to kind of think ahead. And it was an okay flight, considering you see two top, two mid. So you did isolate in 2v1. But this is not nearly greedy enough. Kerrigan cannot 100 to 0 you. So... You, there was no threat for you to fly anywhere you wanted to. All that you had to do is fly behind him. Even if he uses Q on you, you can still then aim your Q and W on him, get free auto attacks off and still kill him. Luckily, Murden hit the Stormbolt. Unluckily, he got hit by the Impale. But you still got the kill, but that could have been much safer. I did notice that, again, you use Barrel Roll to uh, follow him. And it is better to save it as much as you can and get in a better initial position. Uh, Savannah's pushed in the top. It did not go for your tower, which is lucky for you. You're five man mid. So if Savannah's had stayed top, you would have lost two towers. Because no one could or would go top in time. Uh, let's see, you got Hammer Gains and Season Marksman. Uh, this is good, this is good. I would say never take Gathering Storm as fast as Hammer Gains tops you off uh, for Poke. Uh, static Charge would also be fine, but Season Marksman is probably the best at level 1 no matter what. <laughs> Why did he uh, flip her back to safety? He could have body blocked her. But um, at level 7, I hope you get Boomerang because it helps you to push faster and better. And Secret Weapon is too risky against Kerrigan Diablo. You got Secret Weapon. Uh, yeah, it's really risky. First of all, they have Lily. 
who is a blinding support. That means that auto attacks generally go down in value. Uh, and also because of Chromie, Diablo and Kerrigan, standing still and auto attacking becomes very challenging. Chromie tends to hit more of her skill shots. Diablo and Kerrigan can hit their stun combos. So it is a lot of sustained damage on the front line, but it is risky. Boomerang would be safer. It also allows you to wave clear faster and, uh, and then rotate away and go somewhere else. Nonetheless, if we get some stim pack value, secret weapon could be great. It could be great. Oh, nice. Nice power roll. Okay. Now, you guys have lost all the sappers so far, but you've equalized the XP despite losing a lot. Uh, this is good. Now, uh, I like that you went here to get the soak, but you can see two of your allies are closing in. And so it might have been more valuable to walk here and then fly top. Uh, you're probably greeting out over the season marksman stacks, which I absolutely get. I do so myself all the time. But uh, don't underestimate the power of placing one person minimum in every lane that is currently not having a person uh, of your team. You get more XP, and XP is the key to win games. Uh, when you run away from Kerrigan, generally try to do so in a diagonal path like this or like this. Anytime you kind of walk home, the most intuitive way to get away from her, she's going to be far more likely to hit her, her stun combos. Also, let's say if you're standing here, Kerrigan jumps in on you, walk north or south instead of to the gate. Alright, let's see. Once you're going to be revived in three seconds, this is when you should be thinking of a plan. Okay? Uh, so, you just lost Jaina, and they're about to be level 10 first. You're already down 16 shots. Their positioning on the map is spread. And here I am thinking, can you contest anything at all? This is a very difficult situation. Now, the I would say that the pro way to do this would be to poke them off of one uh, while soaking two lanes, get level 10, and then try to secure one of them. The safest way to play this would be to ask all of these guys not to fight, not to contest, give it away, and push all three lanes or at least soak all three lanes get level 10 before doing anything but the way that it's likely going to go down generally is that people are unable to disengage your allies are very well positioned for a full-blown team fight even though their current odds are three versus five and so i would say that the best thing for you to do after all would be to join your allies although it is probably the wrong thing to do even though the opponent might have heroics, they could miss them. Uh, and, and your being there can tilt it in your favor. And we got some pretty nice damage here. That is Lily down. And now, let, that could have been Lily down if, if Impale hit. And that would have meant that you'd be level 9.8. With the wave, you'll be level 10. Maybe your being there would have helped. And so on. And had you flying top, flown top. Not only would you remove the chance to get the Lily kill and capitalize on that situation, but you would have also likely taken some verbal heat from your allies for not being there, despite it essentially looking like a lost venture. They don't have kill pressure, do they? So, uh, not entirely unexpected what's happening here to fill the kill, to die, and to lose both of the towers kind of what I expected but it was as inevitable as it was hopeless because people don't disengage a lot and it's not your fault that they like if as long as no one is talking we're talking about a neutral verbal situation and uh oh my god and so you cannot be blamed for that as pals that obviously I mean you were dead but not about what they did that was their choice and you all that you can do as a solo queue is to oh well, you're not solo queue actually it was a group queue but <laughs> but let's say if you're solo queue uh, all that you can do is to make the best choice with the in information that you have in the game okay 
Intellance Blast. Now the question is, is that the right choice? Normally I would say Gust against this, but they do have a sustained healer in Lily. And uh, and they, they do have that hard engage. Gusting them away could be pretty nice, but you do have an awful lot of lockdown. Impale, Burrow Charge, the Slow, the Stunts, the Ring of Frost. I think Hinterlands is okay. They don't have a Burst Heal or Burst Protect, and they're pretty squishy. Three, of, three to four of them are very squishy. So I would say both is okay. Both is okay. If you prefer Hinterlands, just do that. Oh, you're getting some big secret. Okay, let's. I hope that the game doesn't crash from from rewinding. But I kind of want to talk about this fight because I think mechanically, there's the most to learn from here so far. Uh, okay. I want to go through a few things with you. First of all, uh, anytime you engage, count the odds of the map. Like right before you decide to commit, while you can still think, before the red of the fight, uh, the blood covers your eyes, your vision, look on the map. First of all, Jaina isn't here, so that means you're the only real damage dealer here. That means you need to optimize your damage to be able to get any kills at all. Also, do you see any others on the map? And also Diablo looks like he's doing an obvious bait. Now I've kind of forgotten what happened in the last 10 seconds. So I don't really know if his allies are likely to be here. Or did they recently die? I don't think so. But this looks like a perfect opportunity to lose a 4 versus 5 fight. Against a very obvious bait. Now let's talk. Uh, Chromie is set up here obviously. We can see that already. We do see an absence of Kerrigan, Lily and Sylph. But it could be dangerous. Now let's talk about this. You have turned on your lightning rod against Diablo. And I just want to talk about that a little bit. Because Diablo right now, he's got 100 souls. And you're using all your skill shots on him. And basically, normally, as a damage dealer, you want to auto attack and sustain damage. And, and, and short cooldown damage. The warriors, while saving your big impact for the more juicy targets. The assassins and the supports. Blowing everything on a warrior with limited information while Jaina is not here either is very, very risky. If Kerrigan suddenly jumps in, she has no threat. So auto attacking him is fine, but casting your Q and your W on him is a big risk. It's not wrong per se, but I just want you to know that you're taking a risk here. Furthermore, let's talk about secret weapon. After you throw your secret weapon, you get three or four crit shots, 60% bonus damage. You've got to make use of those three to four. Your auto attack speed is 1.44. That means you'll attack, uh, you get 1.44 attacks off in one second. That's what it means. So you need to either be really good at stutter stepping or just don't move. Just right, throw the Q, don't move. Just right click him, it. right click him. Yeah. And 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 so if he gets locked down, you really don't need to move. Let's see what happens. You barrel in, which is a little bit crazy since Kerrigan and Diablo are there. He can cue you for a stun, you will get apocalypsed. I would like you to see you if you were gonna barrel, I'd like you to barrel like this. But probably you didn't need to because you've got double warrior with lockdown. Then you kind of move, you move. You're still moving, you got stinned, you got blown up, right? But you didn't get a single auto attack off on him. And so, it, as the range damage dealer, it's much better to just keep attacking him. Uh, I'm not surprised by this uh, happening. It was a bad odds fight. I kind of talked about it already. And, you know, this kind of thing happens all the time. But do the minimap check. I like to liken it to driving a car. If you are going to change lane on the highway or you're going to turn a corner, you do a quick check in your rear view mirrors, which are actually not behind you. That's your dead corner, right? That's your blind corner. Rear view mirror, back view mirror, uh, side and front, and then you look around yourself, etc. That is how you should approach every Heroes of the Storm fight. Do a quick check on the minimap, check your positioning, and make sense of it, then make a move. So this was not a good engage. 
Greetings, friend. And uh, oh, it's still okay for you line. to contribute and attack the stunned target, but you must do so without fully committing. Unless you have better info. Okay. Um, Alright. Alright. You've used your fly. And you see Chromie is here. And we also see Diablo Kerrigan are coming for you. So you're zoning in on Chromie. But... All right, let's talk about bower roll here. Um, you identified they were coming for you, you bower roll away, but you're thinking like um, livestock. You're walking away in a direct route to the safest exit, but you need to kind of override your instincts. This is what happens to me as well. When I play on automatic pilot and I'm trying to bower roll away in the, move, in the path that I would normally move as a character, but you need to get familiar with your character and figure out and these are the kind of things you can do before you start a game like kind of think about okay how am i going to use my escape when i use it do i walk to speed up the normal walking route or do i abuse terrain in this particular situation it would have been safer for you to walk here bow roll over it the cool thing about bow roll is even if you traverse an area that is greater than what you can normally cover in power roll if you bow roll like this Let's say this was let's say this was all blocked and all terrain. You could barrel from here into here, and the way barrel works, it will place you on the other side of the terrain if you can traverse half of that distance with barrel roll, like just over half. 51% of the distance you can barrel, it will put you all the way. So you can go over almost any terrain in Heroes of the Storm with barrel roll, and that is a better way to escape than along the walking path. Now, they're getting pretty carried away here. With the chase, Jaina's trying everything she can. She can to stay alive, but got hit. And you've just lost another tower. No freaking way. Come on, man. All right, so uh, I would say probably better to be more objective focused for you. Gust uh, could also help with that. You, um, you suffer from the... Uh, uh, you know, looking at what's on your screen and overly focusing on that. I would say that a great way to get better at that area is to have a checklist before you start a game, like what's important on every map and with, a, with the heroes that you like to play, and then see how you're going to prioritize those objectives. And the kill doesn't really get you anything here. It's better to go for the uh, objective sometimes. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh, it is time to leave. Uh, you got Giant Killer, so you went for the full auto attack build, which uh, it's a really cool build, but I would suggest it against double warrior front lines that also do not have um, great engage. Diablos from the shadows makes it very hard to do constant auto attacking against them. Yeah, I, I would really have liked the Flowrider, Eerie Gust and Boomerang build here. You could poke away with some nice boomerangs on their damages, on their, uh, on their anything basically. But this is a very powerful build, and it is going to do a great number on uh, Diablo. In a way, I kind of like your build here, actually. Because uh, it's almost impossible for your team to kill Diablo if you didn't go for this build. Just because he's so tanky. And it's also difficult to ignore Diablo. Because uh, he is very disruptive. So I do kind of like the build. If you do want to go auto attack build, I would say the only mistake you made is then getting Hinterlands Blast. Because uh, every time you make an auto attack build, you want to focus as much as you can on mobility and counter mobility. An auto attacker that has no bonus movement speed and no disengage is not worth his weight in Nexus Gems. And so Hinterlands Blast, the way you should see Hinterlands, Hey, Thank you, you very much. The job. Great explanations. Thank you, Stevia. The way you should see Hinterlands Blast is it is the value of double auto attacks at a uh, big range 
simultaneously on everyone that you hit with it. Because if you look, Hinterlands does 900 damage. Okay, it's a little bit more than two auto attacks. It's about three auto attacks. Three to three, three and a half. So you do three and a half auto attacks, but with Secret Weapon, Season Marksman, Giant Killer, you're doing so much bonus damage. By comparison, it reduces the value of Hinterlands Blast. Normally, you throw a boomerang, you explode it, you then cast Hinterlands, then another boomerang. It is a great flow, but auto attack build is designed to continually attack without downtime. Hinterlands Blast has a wind up, so you're losing more value with Hinterlands in an auto attack build than with a boomerang build. And so that's why usually when you go auto attack build, you have to gust. Because, like I said, Diablo is a threat. If something goes wrong, you can save yourself. You were hoping to out heal here with, uh, with lifesteal. And you could have done so if you stutter step to the right and stop taking damage from those two archers. But it was a very fringe situation. Anyway, you guys were down to six shots. You're now getting some comebacks. Is that Thunderstrike I see there? Yup. Triple damage on Thunderstrike. Alright, cool. Uh, I also want to commend you for not speaking up. And, uh, you know, engaging in chats when Morales is being toxic towards Jaina. It is very easy to forget that there's a human on the other side of the machine. And, and just, you know feel very entitled to the kind of allies you think you deserve to have but you don't know what Jaina is doing or thinking she might just not uh, oh wow nice job good job she might not know like okay uh, this is what I should do like when she went to split push during the level 10 11 fight here on Diablo was she doing the right thing or the wrong thing did she do so on purpose or because uh, she didn't know any better so Always give advice first. Well-intended, non-aggressive advice. Before even thinking, he's trying to throw the game. There's a lot of keyboard warriors out there who will come up with, uh, we shouldn't have done the boss. But they were quiet before. They did not give any counsel. If you really are the smartest on the team, humor your team by sharing that wisdom before the fact rather than posthumously it can even be as simple as a ping so i like the fact that you didn't uh, mix and chat it's good you're just doing your thing and by the way that's a good level 16 choice that's slow very powerful on uh, on anyone trying to get away and your damage with steam drone is starting to get pretty insane so uh yeah they're starting to kind of fall apart and this is why you should always keep hope, no matter how badly the game is going. Because uh, never underestimate the power of the enemy team throwing and giving you the game. It can always happen. Now. The play here is pretty simple. Let Murden do whatever. Start taking the camp and start taking the tower. And then the rest has to zone out aggressively their, op their opponents. The double cap is not going to achieve anything. As long as Chromie is here, you will not get this. So, uh, since you know Kerrigan is top, so is Mira. You're 4v4 at worst. Kerry is the... Uh, Kerry and Diablo are the greatest uh, engage threat. You know Diablo is coming from bot. So to move in here and to zone Chromie yourself as Falstad would be too risky. Nor do you want to have a wall to your back. You know Diablo is coming from here or here. So you need to be here or here. Where you're standing now, you're going to get stunned. As soon as Diablo decides to move in. However, Diablo suddenly shows up. He's farming souls. And uh, Anubarak should have been here a long time ago to stop Chromie. But having said that, you did get the tower shield. Jaina got it. Chromie, after all, cannot stop this by herself. I did expect more people to come and help. A question from Hippo the Legend, if someone wants to go for the boss and I say it's too risky and they do it anyway, should I join my team even though it's the wrong move? Yeah, you should probably join anyway. I know it feels bad. For me, it feels very bad to go with a wrong decision because uh, it, it, it hurts my ego. 
I am afraid that someone after the fact will say that it was my fault as well. That I do not know any better. By not going, I prove that I knew it was a bad idea. But unfortunately, I also make it true. By not being there, it became an even worse idea than it already was. And so I have engaged in a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm protecting my ego, wanting to seem smart, but I'm sabotaging the game. It is better to say, okay, I have no pride. I have no ego. There is no place for ego in team play. It's only about expected value, the best result for the team. Do I really need to prove myself to my four allies and my viewers that I know better than all of my teammates? Is it important to establish my personal dominance while losing the game? Unfortunately, sometimes the answer seems to be yes, but it shouldn't be. And so even though I am uh, unfailingly fallible, I try to be a better person and I, I should join and, and you, you should join as well. But do do the best you can to make it as less of a disastrous event as possible. For example, if you think it's wrong, but you're doing it anyway and you're going along, do check the bush. Uh, if, especially if you're a warrior, check that bush, see if they're coming in. Be ready to disengage if it becomes opportune. Do mentally prepare to steal the boss back from them as they try to steal it from you. If you have holy ground, do save that and so on. Do your best. Now, uh, your level 20 should be Epic Mount. Epic Mount is like Bolt of the Storm. It's almost instantaneous and it can make you dodge stun chains. And that's four. So let's see what you get. You get the uh, Nexus Frenzy and that is actually a very valid alternative because you already have full auto attack build. It makes you both safer and do more damage. So not a bad thing. It's just usually on Towers of Doom with the altars. I, I would say Epic Mount is pretty, pretty valuable, but I can totally see why you would get that. The only wrong one would have been Call of the Wild Hammer. There would not really be any reason to get that with this build. Alright, so you're pushing in the sappers and Towers of Doom's strategy is not uh, super apparent for everyone. But one of the great things to do is doing exactly what you're doing now. In fact, I would say that from now till the end of the game, you guys should continue to defend their bell tower which is now yours, and continually capturing these sapper camps. What you guys are probably going to do is push the mid keep, but what that will do is give them a free defense bot. If they weren't level 20 yet, they would get it from it. And why would you not be defending this is the question. Look, full health, all heroics, level 20. Level 19, I know they'll be 20 soon, but still. Defender's advantage, you've got the bell tower. Is it not better to defend your keep than to trade XP and let them even up in XP with you? Now, of course, it can be difficult to get that done, but let's take a quick sneak peek at them. I would say normally it is better to defend, but uh, maybe you were not in position because I think Jaina just still came from the core. Taking this is nice. After this, you can probably go bot again, get the keep back, get the double sapper camp, push more sappers in. But what I think is going to happen is you guys will get top keep and sappers. If that is the case, you as Falstad, I would like you to see you push the wave, get the sappers, uh, get the sappers, and there'll be enough time to kill the fort before the sappers arrive. What I would not like to see is just get the keep, don't get the sappers. Okay, so you're pushing. Now, Diablo was going top, you could see. Since you're doing something boring here, uh, which is killing minions together with the group, there should be no optimization of your micro here. Your vision should be entirely aimed at the minimap at this moment. I don't know where you are looking actually, but you should be looking at the map. And you should see that Diablo is coming top. And probably space checking push. 
down. Kerrigan is still showing. This is a safe boss. Apocalypse damage. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think you should fly. Yeah, exactly. You should fly here and you're doing exactly that. That's a good job. Perfect. You went exactly where I thought you should go. Because you want to be ready to scout initially, scope out their positions and interrupt them from capping the altar. Now, pro play would be seek a fight or push the fort before capping. Why? It's so that you get five cannon shots instead of four. Even though it looks like two bell towers will win you the game, no matter if you get a fort first or not, having a five versus four for another 30 seconds is an invaluable resource. If you just capture this and let them come back, you're gonna put the entire game on a 50-50. Whereas if you get a team fight, even under their fort, as long as your mini wave is pushing in, I would say you have a 60-40 at winning this game. And that's not accounting for the fact that Kerrigan is a weak late game hero. She is a weak late game hero. So I would say even if it was 5v5, you would have a slightly better team fight, but it's 5v4. So there's no reason to play like straight up passive. So the cocoon says, let's start the fight. And Jaina should not be cap capping right now. She should be getting ready for this. And you are. You got stimmed. So you want to throw your hammer as it ends. But you know what? He's got... <laughs> Staying near the cocoon allows the right to extend the duration by up to 4 seconds. He's debating your team. Your hammer should have been aimed right as you came out. Oh, never mind. You did not have cool... No, you did. Wait, where did your hammer go? I don't know. Oh, nice. Yeah, you could have aimed it a bit higher, but you know, whatever. Anyway, you guys take the team fight. Thanks to the cocoon, you get that team fight despite capturing the tower. But again, wrong order, right? You guys had all the tools to win this team fight in the exact manner demonstrated. And then you could cap after. So maybe you could say like wait to cap it, but I don't know if Jaina would have listened. Uh, now you get this, and you guys should easily win this fight, walk in the Sapphires and win the game. But well played. Now, yeah, that was uh, pretty much it. I want to give some kind of conclusion, but I don't think there really was any con- What the frack are they doing? Alright, it doesn't matter, because they're gonna walk in no matter what. I want to give some kind of conclusion, but I think mostly the enemy team threw. Um, Kurgan, like I said, has a very good early game. Not such a good mid to late game. Uh, so just knowing... <laughs> just knowing that uh, you're going to be behind early game against Kurgan, and as long as you can neutralize the hero levels, he can come back, is uh, it's a good thing to remember. But also, they gave it to you, so... Nice job keeping your cool. And uh, yeah, GG. Hope there was some kind of use for you out of that. Uh, how do I quit? Like this. Normally, if there was one, two, three people alive for the opponent's team, it was very strange that three members went to the mid lane and not to the bottom. So I understand your exasperation that your team was not guiding in the sappers. But it was true that there were no defenders. So it really didn't matter how everyone spends their final moments in the game. Having said that, recriminating someone after the fact, like, hey, what the fuck, dude, is not as good as having the prescience, the patience to give a call before the moment happens. So... As you're capturing the camp, Kerrigan came in, stunned your Morales, you killed Kerrigan, then you killed Chromie. Right after you win a fight, always do a quick checklist to see what should be the next thing we're going to do. Can we all in the core? Should be the number one. Then, if you can't, can we kill a keep? If you can't, can we kill a fort? If we can't, can we kill a wall? If you can't, can we get a boss? If you can't, can we get their camps? And if you can't, can we get our camps? And if you can't, can you get the soak of the XP? That order should be your checklist every time after you win a fight. And the sooner you start thinking about that, the better. After you got those two kills, 
You quickly look at the map. You look at the death count. You see they're all dead. Or let's say if there was two alive. What is your win condition? Is walking in the sappers. So immediately say, team, stay here as five, walk in the sappers. However you like to say that. Wrong way, Vala. Now the rest. 